Hello, I'm Bruce Gewurz, Chief of Surgery and Vice Dean for Academic Affairs. And today it's our great pleasure to have our Chief of Thoracic Surgery and Vice Chair of the Department of Surgery for uh, Clinical Outreach, Harmik Sakazian. Harmik, welcome. Thank you, Bruce. It's a pleasure to be here. So tell us a little bit about your background. Where did you grow up? Um, I am Armenian. Uh, my family emigrated here uh, after the during the revolution uh, in Iran, and we grew up in Los Angeles my whole life since I was seven years old. When did you first get interested in medicine? I was interested in medicine, I want to say, since probably the seventh grade. I wanted to be a surgeon. What was it <laughs> that it, uh, it turned was you on? My, it's kind of cliche, but my grandmother ended up having a heart attack and a stroke and the EMTs kind of brought her back and she underwent a number of procedures uh, and she survived. And then my, her sibling had a medical problem, a gallbladder issue and wasn't diagnosed and she died. And so these two events kind of showed me how one person's life can continue with medical care and one person's can't if you don't have the right decision making. And so it was really impactful. And so it drove me to medicine. Had anyone else in your family been a physician? No. And did you find a physician role model uh, perchance? Um, so I did not. I, my role model was Hawkeye Pierce. I swear to you, that was the one person that I wanted to be. As I used to watch MASH every single episode, reruns, doesn't matter. And I wanted to be Hawkeye Pierce. I hear you. We a lot of us went through that. Although for me, it was the actual movie mash rather than the oh. TV show because I'm a little older than you. So where did you go to college? I went to call, college at Cal State Northridge, um, uh, and then from there I went to USC for medical school. And residency. So residency, I completed my general surgery residency at Cedar Sinai. Uh, where I did research time as well. And then after that, I went to UCLA for cardiothoracic surgery. And then after UCLA, I went to University of Pittsburgh uh, for a super fellowship uh, to hone my skills in minimally invasive uh, thoracic surgery. So what was it about thoracic surgery that was so interesting to you? Uh, I found early on in medical school, you know, I knew I wanted to be a surgeon. I didn't know exactly what kind, but in medical school, I was able to see that the lungs and the heart were very, very integral to all parts of life, but the physiology in of itself was very interesting to me. Both lung physiology as well as cardiac physiology was just amazing to me. And you could just, it, it made a lot of sense in my mind preload, afterload, elasticity, and all these things. And I just really was attracted to it. And it was very definitive. And patients had immediate outcomes that were just notably impactful for their life. So what do you think in your, in your career has been the biggest change in thoracic surgery, in the practice of thoracic surgery? Thoracic surgery is pretty complicated. And its ability to follow the steps of minimally invasive approaches has been lagging compared to other fields of medicine, of other fields of surgery. For example, gallbladder surgery went from open to minimally invasive laparoscopic surgery. Bariatric surgery, which is more complicated than gallbladder surgery, went the same route, went from open to minimally invasive uh, surgery. But lung surgery in the United States has not followed that path. If you look at the Society of Thoracic Surgery database, only about 50% of lung cancers in the United States are done minimally invasive. And that includes, and this is from people reporting, which are academic institutions. These are not private people in some place. So the difficulty has been not surmounted in the same way as it has for general surgery. And I think it has to do with VATS or video assisted thoracoscopic surgery doing a three dimensional operation with a two dimensional image that has immediate consequences of possible rupture with the pulmonary artery. And I think this is what has led to robotics, which gives you a three-dimensional visualization, really helping surmount that, that gap. Because if you look nationally, all the trends are increasing for robotic surgery. I just published a paper looking at number of, for example, esophagectomies. And for the first time, robotic esophagectomies eclipsed open esophagectomies on the, on the NCDB, National Cancer Database. 
And the same thing is now applicable to lung surgery. And the reason that's important is that people who are trained in open surgery or who are training currently and do mostly open surgery have a hard time doing VATS because the approach is very different. And so this has been a stopgap for people progressing to minimal invasive surgery. But the robotics removes that two-dimensional procedure and allows a person to either proceed with a VATS approach, which is a video-assisted approach, or an open approach, all using the robot because it's three-dimensional. And so it's more intuitive for people to be able to proceed. So let me ask you some related questions to that. You, you raised a really interesting point, which is that in big academic centers such as Cedars and other of our colleagues around the country, uh, patients may get a more advanced approach, which is robotic and or minimally invasive. And do you think this will uh, finally lead to a regionalization uh, of uh, operative load that actually gets diverted to the most experienced places? Well, so some countries in Europe have been practicing that, Netherlands and so far have been trying to do that, and they've succeeded pretty good at it. But in the United States, it's somewhat difficult to regionalize lung surgery, mainly because, for example, I'd say up to 40%, no, but 30% of lobectomies in the United States are done by general surgeons. And those, most of those are in rural places, um, and they're not academic. So we as a society have been trying to advocate for consistent um, metrics to be made. And if you look at it, most of the academic institutions are successful at meeting these metrics, the number of lymph nodes taken, staging, and so forth. Um, but in order to regionalize, it'll be, I think, difficult because you have competing institutions. For example, you look at Boston, you have three incredible institutions within a block of each other. Who are you going to regionalize it to unless you say all the hospitals in this region would do it? Yeah, I think I was thinking more to your point that, that the the hospitals in the hinterland that may not have the super specialist, you know, at what point does the benefit to the patient uh, exceed the convenience of being done in a small hospital close to where they live? Yeah, I, I agree with you. I've had many patients come to me from rural areas, and after they've had another operation that was substandard, for example, and it all comes down to patients fear of leaving where they know and being comfortable with their with their primary care physician um, but some of them will do their due diligence and do research and on their own come for a second opinion and then usually stay but i do believe that as social media increases and, and as patients awareness increases of what's available out there that they are more apt to start seeking out quaternary and tertiary centers for their care so another problem with the minimally invasive revolution, if you will, is that there aren't enough open cases left to train people. Since you had an evolution where you did strictly open surgery and then were prepared to evolve into a minimally invasive surgeon, the younger generation just doesn't have enough of those open cases being done, possibly, uh, to learn the skill set. So when they need to do an open case, are they going to be ready to do it? So I believe yes. I believe the only thing that I think that is going to be lacking for them when they want to do routine open cases, in specific to, to chest surgery, is the thoracotomy of how to spare the muscles as you're getting in. That's kind of a learned trait. But that's not that big of a deal. But the operation, the, the, the core operation itself, meaning the lung cancer surgery, the lobectomy, I think if you can do a robotic or minimally invasive lobectomy, you can 100% do an open lobectomy. It's much easier. And so I think these guys are very well prepared. I think if you can do a minimally invasive lobectomy, whether it's robotic or, or uh, VATS, I think you're well set to do an open lobectomy. Sure, there are some nuances. The reason most of these open, though, are emergent. And so they just have to learn how to deal with emergent situations and not panic and get the patient through it. But I think that their skill set is gonna be well served with this, with this uh, teaching platform. Let's shift gears a little bit. What, what type of research, uh, particularly translational research, you think will have the biggest impact on your practice of thoracic surgery? I think personalized medicine is a big deal. I'm, we're collaborating currently with PhDs here and we're working on, on some uh, SRNA, uh, tissue samples and so forth for, for 
genetic profiling of certain kind of tumors in certain patient populations. But I think that the future of medicine, of surgery, is going to be in adjunct with medical therapeutics. And these medical therapeutics are not going to be global toxic chemotherapies. Rather, they're going to be targeted towards certain mutations or immunotherapies towards certain vectors that are going to affect that tumor. And that is going to be usually combined with surgery. Um, the other thing that's interesting that, that comes of note is the ability to increase um, the uh, amount of antigen that's expressed by a tumor. So it's called the apscopal effect. So which is why SBRT or radiation therapy prior to any kind of something else will increase the tumor reactivity of the immune system. So if someone gets a left upper lobe tumor irradiated, usually their right upper, their lung, right lung cancer will start shrinking because of the immune response. And so there are ways of discussions of, of causing, leaving the tumor inside you, causing some kind of cell death that increases the tumor immune response. So those are all things that are coming around in the future. It's going to be all about tailored medicine, uh, personalized medicine. Um, and, you know, Cedars has this twin system that they have where they're building uh, this incredible uh, translational medicine research platform, which we're going to be a part of. And I think that's going to really revolutionize surgery. So it's my perception, and I think the data would bear me out, that people in America are smoking less and pollution may be marginally uh, better. Has that changed the distribution of lung cancer, the, either the incidence or the types of lung cancer? So lung, lung cancer in women has actually risen, um, and they're not exactly sure why that is. They're not sure if it's hormone-related or not, and that's one of the research aspects that we're looking at. Um, smoking has decreased. However, lung cancer still remains the number one cancer killer. So, but there's not a good screening platform. So there has been multiple uh, bodies that have advocated for lung cancer screening in at-risk populations, which would be over 50, 50 years of smoking, 15 years of smoking, and so forth. There's certain, par certain things that they've done. It's been published, and it was a trial in Europe was done as well. They both showed a 20% reduction in mortality. However, you don't see the same emphasis on lung cancer screening that you do, for example, with colon cancer or with breast cancer. And I believe that if screening increased, the mortality would significantly drop for patients. But smoking definitely has decreased, but lung cancer still remains the, the number one killer. Now, we were uh, talking before our discussion about COVID. Uh, what type of uh, problems have you seen and survivors of COVID uh, in long-term issues with their lungs? So, as you know, COVID is an evolving situation and, and people are still continuing, as we call COVID recovered, to evolve and progress in their disease. So one patient may get COVID and not do too badly. However, as I told you, we were just discussing, if we had young patients who had COVID and their lungs just continue to progressively get more and more fibrotic and it, they develop the nematoceles, which means that there's like a big bubble that forms inside of the lung from the destroyed tissue. So instead of having little sacs that convey, that transmit oxygen through the blood, they're just, all these little sacs coalesce and get destroyed into one big fibrotic mass that adds nothing except takes up space. And also the lungs lose their elasticity. So instead of expanding and contracting to let you inhale and exhale uh, air, it's becoming more and more restrictive. And so patients are not breathing as well, not oxygenating as well. On top of that, they're not even sure about some cardiac effects that are coming out of COVID. So it's, it's an evolving field, but it's definitely much more difficult to operate on someone who's undergone COVID and recovered versus one that has not. Do you think that uh, given the number of people in the United States that have been affected by COVID that it will be like a substantial challenge in the years to come? Or do you think it will, you know, hopefully that once we get the uh, disease under control and stop new cases, that this will peter out and not be a big challenge? I think that once we get the disease under control and we continue to vaccinate, get in front of the variants, then, then it'll be fine. However, we have a large cohort of patients who have already been infected and have had some hospitalizations or intubations or have had sequelae in their lung from COVID. And this is not a small cohort. 
and they're not all very old and they're going to continue to live and i think that this cohort is going to continue to possibly evolve in their fibrosis and continue to get worse and they are going to develop lung cancer like any other population would and they're going to pose significant challenges to surgery in patients who are covid recovered yeah, historically, uh, thoracic surgery is such an interesting specialty because it started out basically as tuberculosis surgery. Correct. And of course, thank thankfully, in the main, tuberculosis is not the problem in the United States that it used to be. And uh, what do you think, uh, sort of to wrap this up, what do you think uh, 20 years from now will be the most prevalent problem that thoracic surgeons deal with? That's a... Fantastic question. Um, I think that lung cancer will still be around. Um, and I think that it will be around not necessarily because of smoking, but patients undergo genetic changes. As, you, as I told you, non-smoking females are getting lung cancer. Why? We don't know. And so I think that lung cancer is still going to be an issue um, in the next 20 years. Uh, I think, though, that with the onset of screening and with personalized medicine, that the cure rates are going to increase dramatically, like they have for, let's say, breast cancer or leukemia. I think, I think that surgery for lung cancer will continue to partner with evolving therapeutics to give patients a much better survival and long-term lifespan. Well, terrific. Harmic, I know you've built a terrific program here, and the, uh, the volume of work, and most importantly, the quality of the work that you and your colleagues do is is really incredible. And whenever I wander into your operating room and, and see that uh, robotic uh, uh, screen and see the incredible visualization, uh, I, I, I must say it's just really impressive. So thank you for your time today. We really enjoyed it. It's been a pleasure and thank you.